All right, welcome everybody to the first 2022 Food and Friends Nutrition Webinar. Um, we're looking forward to the series this year. And if you guys can't join us in person, then know that you can see the recording. Um, again, feel free to drop questions in the Q&A along the way or at the end as they come to you. Um, and I am Becca Khan. I will show my video briefly. I'm the Nutrition Services Director here. And we also have support from the rest of the Nutrition Services team. We have Grace and Agata and Ashley. Um, so we are gonna be talking today specifically about renal nutrition. And of course, now it's not going to advance. There we go. We're gonna be talking specifically about um, dialysis care and nutrition. And we are gonna touch a little bit on the, the connection between diabetes and end-stage kidney disease because they're so commonly overlapped. We're gonna talk about the specific recommendations to food and nutrition when it comes to dialysis and nutrition and what that might mean for you individually and as a food and friends client or a potential food and friends client. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about kind of the specific changes you'll see in the food and friends meals or groceries. So just as a reminder, this is not um, talking about earlier stages of kidney disease. If people have questions about that, you can definitely reach out to us at Food and Friends, but this is really about dialysis care nutrition, and it's a really big topic. So we are not going to go over every detail, um, but we're gonna cover some really big points, things that have changed and some things that haven't. And a lot of it really depends on your own body. So again, if you have specific questions um, that are not answered by this presentation for your own body, then it makes sense to talk to the dietitian at dialysis and or call us at Food and Friends and we might be able to help navigate things for you. But because it's so individualized, the recommendations for your own body might change over time, you know, month to month or year to year. But with that said, um, we also are going to introduce some polls which are new to us at Food and Friends um, Nutrition Webinars. So the first one is just a poll to make sure that we all understand and can use the poll feature. So I'm going to see actually if I can, I think I can do that. Um, so I don't need to, you to do it, Grace, but I am going to just make sure that everybody is comfortable using the poll feature. So the first one is um, are you currently a Food and Friends client? Yes or no? Okay, so we have people that answered no to that one. Um, so people know how to use the poll feature, which is great. And because diabetes is such a big part of end-stage renal disease, and this is not a talk about diabetes, um, I just want to see if people are interested or have questions or information, need information about diabetes um, when it comes to end-stage renal disease. So I'm gonna ask folks here if anybody has type two diabetes or Okay, so no, um, but you might be working with folks. Oh, we have somebody, yes. So you might be working with folks who need to know about how diabetes impacts um, nutrition when it comes to dialysis. So I'm just gonna touch upon it a little bit. Um, and generally, I just want to say, that one of the long-term impacts of very high blood sugar, so we're looking at an A1C over eight, 
that's going to be reduced kidney function. So all the tiny blood vessels in our kidneys that are working to filter blood to make urine, they're not going to work as well um, if the, your blood sugar is constantly really, really high. So when the kidneys are damaged beyond the point of repair, that's end stage renal disease. When we go on dialysis, they can't filter out blood to make urine anymore, um, which is part of the reason that end stage renal disease is so closely linked to blood sugar in particular. Um, so do people here, you can raise your hand or I'll try and ask a poll question, but do you know generally how that A1C number that I mentioned and blood glucose are related? So I'll just explain briefly again for those who might be working with folks on dialysis, um, the, a, the lab A1C, which really is a hemoglobin A1C, is looking at your average blood glucose or blood sugar over three months. And the reason that we see it as a percentage, like maybe 6% or 8% or 10%, it's kind of the, the percentage of the red, um, the red blood cells that are covered in some amount of sugar or glucose. So it's kind of measuring something different than um, that single point in time blood droplet. But if people have more questions about diabetes and end-stage renal disease, please reach out to us at Food and Friends, and we're happy to chat with you about that more. So moving on to the actual topic today um, of end-stage renal disease and dialysis care nutrition, trying to advance the slide here. For some reason, it's not advancing, of course. Um, we'll talk a little bit about what's changed when it comes to sodium and potassium and phosphorus. So the good news is that when it comes to sodium, not a whole lot has changed. The old recommendations say to have less than 2,400 milligrams a day. The new recommendations say less than 2,300 milligrams a day. So who here wants to guess what that 100 milligrams difference is. Whoops, now it's advancing too much. You may have seen it there. <laughs> um, but when you're looking at just 100 milligrams over the course of a whole day, any guess of what that might be? <laughs> you may have seen it as I advance. Yeah. Half a stick of cheese. Um, so as that picture showed, it's about half a stick of string cheese or a cheese stick over the course of a whole day. So that's not a huge difference when you think about everything that you're taking in over the course of the day. Um, but what, where the big recommended changes are, are really around phosphorus and a little bit about potassium. So when it comes to phosphorus, the old recommendations said to have somewhere between 800 and 1,000 milligrams a day. Turns out that's really hard to measure and hard to know what that looks like because it's not really measured very well on that nutrition facts label. So if somebody is using a nutrition facts label to figure out you know, how much um, they're allowed in a day, they're not gonna get that information there. And we've also learned that there are different types of phosphorus out there in food and it's absorbed differently. Um, so we've done more research into what people actually eat and what's harmful versus beneficial. Um, and ultimately the new recommendations say to 
adjust your intake to maintain normal serum levels. So what does that mean in the real world? That means to continue checking your lab values and look over that dialysis report card and see what your body can take any given week or month. Um, and again, that change is because we've had, we have a better understanding about how our body processes the different types of phosphorus in our food. So we'll break this down a little bit more. When it comes to phosphorus specifically, since we don't look at um, food, we don't think about eating nutrients necessarily, but we think about eating real food, the old recommendations said it's okay to have low phosphorus foods like white bread, an apple, and unsalted pretzels. But it also recommended avoiding things like whole grain bread, beans, dairy, which has a good source of protein, um, and things like nuts and seeds. The new recommendations say that these foods like whole grain bread, beans, dairy protein, nuts and seeds are allowed. However, you just have to check in with your own blood values and see when you need to moderate and cut down. And also there are so many phosphate binders out there. So it's kind of, you know, again, a personalized choice. Do you, does your body need to really limit it and or take more FOS binders or, you know, are you doing okay with the amount that you're, you're currently taking in? And part of the reason that they've really expanded the recommendations to allow these foods is because oftentimes the benefits are going to outweigh the harm or the possible harm. And because again, everybody's body and their blood values are going to be a bit different from their neighbor and different from their own needs over time. So it's, it's really hard and not helpful to have overly restrictive recommendations. Um, so breaking it down a little bit more into those different types of phosphorus that we understand greater now, there are two types, as I mentioned. There's the naturally occurring, which is also called organic phosphorus, um, which not to be confusing, is not really the same as the marketing term like organic, uh, you know, spinach or strawberries or something. But our body absorbs this type of phosphorus less than it does um, from another type of phosphorus. So these are not the problem. So again, the whole grain bread, the protein sources like chicken or beef or fish, and the naturally occurring phosphorus found in something like brown rice, um, or again, those whole grains like whole grain bread. Our body does not absorb this completely and the benefit out often outweighs the harm. So these foods also are really high in protein, in B vitamins, which is something that's always a concern with folks on dialysis. There's heart healthy fats in whole grains. There's um, a little bit of protein even in the whole grains. There's fiber that you're getting, which is important again, if you're monitoring blood sugar values or blood glucose values. Um, the fiber also helps us have more regular bowel movements and reduces the issues around constipation, which again is something that folks on dialysis are so often um, burdened with. So the other type of phosphorus, which is really used as a preservative in food, um, you can see it here listed on the ingredients. It's, you know, here it's tricalcium phosphate. You can look at the ingredient list and see if there's anything with that word phos in it. Our body really absorbs a lot more of this and it's also really hard to avoid this altogether because it's in so many foods right now in our food supply. And if 
you know, it's really hard for you to avoid as well, this is another place where you can use those fast binders if needed. I'm going to just check the Q&A and I don't see any questions. If anybody has any questions about this so far, we can take a pause. You can put something in the Q&A and we'll address it. Okay, so moving on, when we're talking about phosphorus in particular, I really wanted to again reiterate that we don't eat foods called phosphorus and potassium and sodium, we eat whole real foods, we eat something called bread. So what you'll see in the food and friends meals is a little bit more of the whole wheat bread because um, the old recommendations recommended avoiding whole wheat bread. The new recommendations really outline the benefits of having whole wheat bread. So you're gonna see more whole grain products than whole wheat bread when it comes to the food and friends meals. Um, and if that becomes a problem for you and your FOSS is really high, you can call your food and friends dietitian and chat about it and also chat with the dialysis dietitian about you know either changing or adding some of the FOSS binders that you might need to take. But ultimately, um, the research over the years has found that telling folks on dialysis to avoid whole wheat bread was doing more harm than good. Dairy is another food that is changing with the phosphorus recommendations. So it has been recommended in the past to really limit or avoid dairy altogether because it has some naturally occurring phosphorus. Um, which is absorbed at lower rates than that phosphorus as an additive or preservative. It often does have some potassium, but that might vary depending on the dairy product. And now the recommendation is that it's okay to add dairy into your diet. Good idea to start maybe slow, about half a cup or four ounces a day. Um, and, and kind of monitor those blood values over time and see if this is gonna be okay for you. Um, and so in the food and friends meals, that means that we're starting to send regular cow's milk and regular yogurt, for example. You might see some cheese here or there as well. Um, but again, you wanna review your labs and if, this is becoming a problem for you and you need to make a change to your food and friends meals, you can ask for the no dairy meal plan that will still be renal friendly. But you're going to start to see more milk in your deliveries um, and yogurt as well. The milk for both HDM and GTG and the yogurt is just for folks getting GTG. So moving on from phosphorus, Potassium has always been a big restriction and still is something to monitor when it comes to folks on dialysis. So the old recommendation said somewhere between 2,300 and 2,700 milligrams a day-ish, so give or take. And again, there was always this recognition that it was going to change based on your own personal needs. So they've recognized that. And again, similar with phosphorus, they say adjust the intake to maintain nor normal serum or blood values. So what does that mean? It means again, review your labs and change your diet, maybe monthly, maybe yearly. It'll depend on, on what's needed for you, um, depending on how your labs look. And why has this changed? Again, there's been a lot of research on how folks are living, the quality of life, what people are able to eat when it comes to dialysis, and what the benefits and harms of those old recommendations were. And really, there are so many benefits to having a wide variety of fruits and vegetables that might have some potassium um, that it, it didn't make sense to overly restrict people. and some people might not have a, a problem with really high potassium levels, so they maybe didn't need that restriction. So again, it's saying look at your own lab values and your own food intake 
so you're not limited to just the same fruits and vegetables um, and maybe there's room for some more variety. The benefits of, you know, fruits, a wide variety of fruits and vegetables, again, you're getting lots of fiber, you're enjoying more foods, um, you know, the, you're getting different amounts of maybe vitamin C or other nutrients that, that your body might need. And also those B vitamins are lots of, uh, in some fruits and vegetables that you might be excluding and B vitamins, as we said, often a problem um, for folks on dialysis. So just taking a pause here, um, any questions from, from the group? Just wanna make sure people are comfortable using the um, chat function, but I don't see any. So what hasn't really changed? The recommendations for overall calorie and protein, pretty much the same. Um, again, it's gonna vary from person to person, but in general, the needs for calories and protein are usually higher than they would be for, you know, an individual once they're on dialysis, as opposed to that same person before they were on dialysis. But still something to check in with the dietitians about and see if you need to kind of up your intake or cut down on your intake. But the general um, national recommendations and international recommendations haven't changed tremendously. Fluid needs also hasn't changed tremendously um, and it really will be individualized. I will say that if you're not sure, if you're new to dialysis and you're not sure what your limits are, it's a good idea to limit it to about four cups of liquid a day until you know what your recommendations are, but definitely make, make time to talk to that renal dietitian about what your needs are. So at Food and Friends, we send soup because it's a really healthy way to get in some protein and some nutrients. Um, they're homemade here at Food and Friends. We keep them all very low in sodium um, and you can use them as the base of another meal or to you know, make a stew out of um, and add more, uh, add more food to it so it becomes less a fluid meal and more of um, just a protein type meal that's soft. So again, if you want to chat about ways to use those soups to your needs at home, just give us a call at Food and Friends and we can talk to you about that. But it is going to be important to look at um, the fluid needs that don't give you a lot of protein. So things like maybe tea or coffee or juice or soda, um, or just, you know, plain broth based soups that don't have a lot of chicken or, or beans or something or seafood added to it. So just to reiterate some changes you'll see in the food and friends meals in particular, you're going to start seeing some more whole grains, both in the home delivered meals or HDM and the GTG, you'll see a little bit more dairy in the home delivered meals and GTG. And if that's a problem for you, we can restrict that further. And you'll see a bit more, what we say, liberalized diet. So there'll be some more fruits and vegetables um, that you'll see in, in your bags. If you don't need any of these restrictions, um, then you can talk to your dialysis dietitian and have that dietitian talk to us at Food and Friends or send us your labs and we'll review it. Um, and we can remove some of these restrictions if ultimately you know, the renal diet here at Food and Friends is even too restricted for you. So there are options. So I wanna take time now and go over any questions that the group might have about Food and Friends meals or anything related to um, the renal meal plan. And if we don't have any questions, um, I'll go ahead and make sure that folks have an understanding about why we limit phosphorus and potassium. Um, because I talked about what has changed, but I want to make sure folks also understand why 
it's important that we're looking at those. So why is too much phosphorus bad for us if we're on dialysis? Yeah, we can lead to muscle problems, including heart muscles, or can lead to hard or stiff, rigid blood vessels. All right, I'll give it another couple of seconds, see if anybody else is gonna answer. Okay, so the correct answer is that um, if we don't have kidneys filtering our blood and the phosphorus builds up in our blood system, it can lead to hard or stiff, rigid blood vessels, which can become a problem over time, which is why it's important to know if there's too much phosphorus in our blood at any given time and do what we can to lower it. And that can happen through diet, that can happen through the FOSS binders as well. Um, so the other question is about potassium. Do people know why we're supposed to limit our potassium if we're, we're on dialysis? It can lead to diarrhea, can lead to heart muscle problems or a heart attack or both. Okay, getting some answers in, I see. So all correct answers here, um, both actually can lead to diarrhea and maybe more importantly, it can lead to heart muscle problems or heart attack. So it's really the same issue. The diarrhea is because it's causing more kind of muscle contractions in our GI tract but it becomes a much more dangerous problem when those muscle problems are problems of the heart muscle. Um, so that's why it is important to monitor the amount of potassium in our blood at any given time. But this can be addressed also through, um, through dialysis. You can you know, immediately take some um, potassium binding medication as well if that's really needed. And again, there are so many benefits to having fruits and vegetables and foods that are rich in potassium um, that you have to really look at what your lab values are and what your body needs. Do you really need more protein um, from dairy? Do you need some you know, fruits and vegetables for the fiber so that you can have regular bowel movements and just get all the nutrients that you need? Um, or do you really need to limit it right now and kind of be on the more restrictive end? So again, continue to check in with, with your own labs and what your body needs. So if no one has any more questions, um, I'm gonna ask somebody from my team to put the survey link in the chat or the Q&A. Um, and if you can take just, probably two minutes to answer that survey. And also in that, it'll let us know some other topics that you might wanna hear us talk about. Um, that would be really helpful to us. And while we still have you here, we will still take questions in the Q&A. All right, Grace put that link in the chat. Um, so feel free to um go ahead and um yeah i think that second one is is the link to get that survey going so we'll leave that up for a couple of minutes so folks can kind of copy and paste that and we'll try and include that in the follow-up email as well thanks so much everybody for joining us looks like there weren't any questions um but if you have any follow-up questions, you can reach out to us individually or nutrition at foodandfriends.org. I'll type that in the chat as well. And we thank you all for being here. Have a great rest of the day and you take care.